experiences very separately. They were separated for five years. So after the war, they really needed a vacation, and they decided to have that vacation in Scotland where they had originally gotten married. Um, and so they were sort of treating this like a second honeymoon. And what they were doing was they were uh, touring around together, spending quality time together. And then also, Frank has as a hobby genealogy. And so he was studying genealogy with a friend of his um, in town a lot. And that gave Claire some free time. And her hobby is botany and um, medicinal botany in particular because she has this nurse aspect to her life. And so one day, uh, they, they're touring around, they go to these standing stones. So a mini stone has she, called Cray Dune, and she sees a flower there that she's trying to identify. So she, she goes back the next day to get it um, <coughs> while Frank is doing his genealogy thing, and she hears the stones screaming. Uh, and this is where it goes from being sort of a normal story into a little sci-fi. Um, so she hears the stones screaming, she goes over to investigate, she touches them, and falls back in time 200 years. Yeah, where she encounters a guy who looks just like her husband, who turns out to be one of the ancestors that he's been studying genealogically. Um, and his name is Black Jack Randall, and so that was a big oopsie, she fell back in time, and like double oopsie, she thinks this guy is her husband, but really he's this really, really bad guy. He's the villain of the show, he's, he's a sadist, he's not a good guy. Uh, so she runs into him, he kind of uh, is like, you're suspicious in the woods, and he attacks her. But she's rescued by a bunch of Scots, because it turns out the British soldiers in the 1740s and the Scots in the 1740s were sort of having a little skirmish over cattle, um, which is a constant theme in the books. Uh, the Scottish are always stealing the cattle. Um, and so the Scots are like, well, I don't know who she is, but if the Brits think she's bad, then she must be our friend. <laughs> so they rescue her and take her away. Um, and then all kinds of various political um, maneuverings within the Scottish Highlands and her being a stranger, she has no identity. She just showed up out of nowhere. It's very odd for the 18th century. Uh, but all of these things lead her into being forced into marriage with this red-headed Scotsman named Jamie Frazier. Uh, what was her, which feels so bad for her. <laughs> And I'm sure it's not a big surprise to realize that her real love story and the reason this goes to nine books is with this uh, Scottish man. Um, so now the question is, so that's like the upshot of the plot of the show. But the question is, what does that have to do with archaeology in Maryland? And um, the answer is basically that, well, we're fans of the books. And then you've seen all kinds of tedious work that we did. And you've seen Kate Schaefer like doing her thing. Right? So what would happen is we would listen to the books um, at work, sometimes all at the same time, especially if a new book had just come out. And we would talk about it at tea time, you know, <laughs> and just be like, have you gotten to the end of book eight yet? Uh, and, and that is a really big compliment for historical fiction. Because if you have a bunch of history geeks sitting around loving a series enough to stick with it, then you know that they're getting all that material culture right. That you know, like, if it would be really jarring to us to be working on artifacts from that time period on a daily basis, we handle the real thing, and to listen to a book that's describing it all wrong. But these books get it right, and so we love these books. And so Kate, as I told you, our, one of our conservatives, this is her idea, she was just kind of joking around with one of her coworkers one day. Was like, we should totally do an exhibit on Outlander, and she's like, we should totally do an exhibit on Outlander. You know, the more she thought about it, the more she said it made sense. So she came to me one day and said, I have this idea. I think we should do this, but you're probably going to have to do most of the work. <laughs> and that's because I'm one of the curators there. So I handle the artifacts. I know the artifacts. She's in conservation. She gets things when they're falling apart, right? So she can't just take the lead on an exhibit. Um, so I was like, fine, you know, go talk to the bosses. And like five minutes later, I get a call from my boss. And she's like, OK, we've booked the Prince Frederick Library case for May. And I was just like, oh. So anyway, it's a great project. And it's turned out really great. Um, but initially, it was, it was like, wow, we have about a, two months to pull this off. Um, but uh, it was a fairly pleasant two months. Um, we went into all the artifacts. We pulled what we were excited about. 
Um, we have a lot of really fantastic 18th century collections at the Mac Lab, and we knew that we could really illustrate this time period and several themes, so we chose a bunch of select panels, um, stills from the show. We had our PR person call stars and make sure that they were okay with us using their images this way. We're like, we're not making a profit. They said, fine, here's our press kit. They gave us a link to their, their images online. And this is initially what, what the first exhibit iteration looked like in the Prince Frederick Library. Now, I won't say that this was a hardship. <laughs> um, we had to spend a lot of time at work uh, researching these images, and that was pretty great. Um, so, uh, you know, I will say if I ever was doing this over again, one of the hazards was that I got desensitized to looking at this guy. I'm not really sure how I feel about that. Um, but, you know, we definitely had a lot of fun with this project. And um, among other things, it's just a really amazing way to feature what we have at the Mac Lab. And we have eight and a half million artifacts. We were able to get some of our best sites and our best collections out to the public to be able to show off um, and to be able to travel around because Outlander is popular enough that people want to see this exhibit. The exhibit has uh, about 200 artifacts in it. It doesn't look like that much because it's fairly small. Um, but it does have about 200 artifacts, and they come from 30 different sites across the state of Maryland. Uh, one of the things that we have a hard time interpreting at the Mac Lab is that we have artifacts from across the state, even though we're sort of isolated in Calvert County. And so we wanted to feature things from as far and wide as we could, and the sky was the limit in terms of the artifacts. We wanted to get like some of the groupiest artifacts we had. So they go all the way from the eastern shore to Washington County. And now I'm going to get into a little bit in terms of the artifacts that, that we were featuring at this site, or, or in this exhibit. So first site I want to talk about is the King's Reach site, which is on our park. Uh, so Jefferson Patterson Park is about 500 acres on the Patuxent River, and it is, uh, it is sort of became a state park and an archaeological park because of the fact that it had at least 75 archaeological sites on it. So the private owners, the Patterson family, donated the site, the, the park to the state for that reason. So there have been various excavations that have happened on the park, and the King's Reach site is one of them. And I'd like to highlight this particular site uh, because these the artifacts you see here are from the site with the exception of the cross, which um, we, we didn't have a, a rosary that we could feature in the exhibit, but it was something that Jamie Fraser carried in the books and, in the, and would have carried in the show, although I don't think they've shown that. Um, but we did have beads and we did have a reliquary that would have been part maybe of a rosary, so we, we put it together. So we were, we were doing uh, French artifacts, we were calling it. We were just pulling out that stuff. Anyway, the King's Reach site, all those beads came from there. And I like to feature this site because it's, it's got an early end date. So 1711 is when this site was no longer occupied. Um, and the time period that we're dealing with in Outlander is the 1740s. And in the 1740s, both Scotland and, and Maryland were English assets. So they both have all these English goods being spread out throughout the market. So a lot of the stuff that we have in Maryland is the same as what they would have used in Scotland. Um, but I like featuring this site because um, I like it to make it clear uh, that I'm sure it's true in your lives that um, people don't just throw everything out every year and buy everything brand new again. So you can have a bottle and a saddle and a gun and coins and a mortar and pestle from 1711 showing up in a scene from the 1740s. It's not that unusual, especially a mortar and pestle is pretty durable, you're not going to buy that over and over. Saddles are like a piece of furniture. You're going to take care of that and try to hold on to it for a long time. Um, and even bottles. Um, we tend to think of bottles as being fairly disposable, not necessarily being used over and over. But in this time period, your bottles are being imported from overseas. And so people are reusing them. Um, they might, you can, um, you can use them for, for transporting liquids. So if your liquids are coming over in kegs, like barrels, tierces, all of those terms for different sizes of, 
of storage um, that get tapped. Then you need other containers to carry all of those liquids around when you're ready to serve them. So the bottles are good for that. And then there have also been some bottles found down in Williamsburg that um, people were making their own liquor in them, fermenting their own liquor. The Cherry Bounce was one. They sort of found a cellar full of bottles where they were, they were fermenting cherries to turn them into liquor. So those bottles, uh, they're quite substantial and they do last. And I brought one. Uh, there's a bunch in the exhibit, but we still didn't have room for all of them. And I brought one that even though this is the real deal, um, you can handle it under supervision after the talk if you want to get a feel for how durable those are. Another site that's right on our park is the Smith St. Leonard site. And this site is 1711 to 1754, so anything goes from this site for our 1740s time period for Outlander. Um, we totally love this site. It is always producing really cool small finds. Uh, small finds is what we call anything that we don't find in bulk. So we find things like brick and oyster shell and ceramic shirts in bulk. We find lots and lots and lots of them every time we put a shovel in the ground. But we don't always find a pair of cufflinks, or a corkscrew, or a buckle. Those are all small, what we call small finds, uh, because they're found in small quantities, not necessarily the size of the find itself. Anyway, the Smith St. Leonard site is our public archaeology site. So if any of you are interested in archaeology and coming out and digging and volunteering, in May and June, this site, uh, we have a program where you basically call ahead, find out when there's a slot, when you have a free day, and you can come out and work on excavating this site with our archaeologists on staff. Um, so you too can help find some of these really cool artifacts. One of the best things about this site is that we have a map from the 18th century, uh, 1770s thereabouts, recording a, a court case where there was a property boundary dispute, and somebody basically marked on this map, well, that's where the old house was, and that's where the stable was, and that's where the slave quarter was. And that's the map that you see here. And every time archaeologists have tested this map with an overlay of the artifact distributions, they've hit those buildings that were talked about. So it's really fantastic stuff. My favorite artifact from this site that's in the exhibit is metallic threads. Um, metallic thread embroidery was big in the 18th century. It was a way of literally wearing your wealth on your clothes and decorating your clothes at the same time. So these are silk threads wrapped in silver ribbons and um, it's very, very tiny. It looks like tiny little roots. So I brought some of those with me at the microscopes because you just can't imagine. Like this picture shows you what they look like when you see for yourself with the contrast. It just really brings it to life. And this is the kind of clothing that people don't necessarily think of colonial Maryland people wearing, but they were. This kind of metallic thread embroidery was here. Another site that I love to talk about is the Burley Tannery site. This one is out in Frederick County. Um, and industries were starting up in the 18th century in Maryland. And a tannery is one of those sort of Western Maryland industries that started up outside of Frederick. And we have some shoe parts in the exhibit from Burley Tannery. And I brought a couple of other shoes from Burley Tannery that we weren't able to finish the exhibit that you can see up close. Most of the time, we don't find leather archaeologically because when it's deposited, little bugs and microbes and bacteria and everything will eat all of that organic material. But this tannery was so full of chemicals and acids and just really horrible, horrible um, you know, living environment for bacteria that none of the bacteria was able to live there. So all of that leather survived. The archaeologists come in, they dig it up, they find the shoes, they find the pieces of leather. Um, so we have really great preservation from this site and we're able to actually show examples of the shoes. Another more Western Maryland site that we feature in the exhibit is called Fort Frederick. Uh, are you guys all familiar with Fort Frederick? I know Kristen is. <laughs> um, so Fort Frederick is out of Washington County, and this is a French and Indian War Air Force, built 1756, 1758, thereabouts. Uh, it never really saw any action, uh, but in a way that's really great for archaeologists because you've got a bunch of board guys sitting around doing stuff. And when they're doing that, they're generating trash and losing their clothing parts and whatnot. So, um, you know, we've got a lot of buttons, a lot of buckles, a uh, sword clip for the, the scabbard for your sword. 
um, various buckles that are for the strap that goes over the shoulder uh, to hold your weapons. So we definitely get a lot of great artifacts, and this time period is very close to our time period. I also like this site a lot because we have evidence of button making going on at the site. People were carving bone into button molds, these one whole bone button molds. are They essentially are the, the backdrop for a cloth button or maybe even a needlework button, which was popular during this time period. And there's been a lot of, there's been some debate, I guess, in archaeology. A lot of people think, oh, well, um, you know, the men wouldn't have sewn their own buttons. They must have had their women there with them. But, but really, in this time period, the men were able to sew and mend their, their own clothes, um, especially if you're out on a military function. Um, you might travel with your housewife, and you might know how to do your own mending. Um, and I think this fits really well with Outlander, because those of you who have read the books, uh, would know that Jamie Fraser and all of the men in the Highlands that are featured in these books, they all know how to do things like that, especially knitting is emphasized in the books. So when I put this picture of knitting here, um, men were capable of doing these kinds of things at that time period. It wasn't the same uh, necessarily like division of labor that you might get in, in let's say, the Victorian era. Um, so I put this picture of this man knitting. We're going to come back to knitting here in a little bit. Uh, just by way of proving that yes, men could have been making these buttons and covering them with cloth and keeping up their their uniforms all on their own at Fort Frederick. Now the slides are going to get really crowded here. So, so the this site, the Addison Plantation, is another site I have to feature because it contributed probably the most artifacts to the exhibit. Um, and I just squeezed them all on here to overwhelm you with just how many artifacts we squeezed in from this site. <laughs> this site, the Addison Plantation, is located down where um, the, like right where the Woodrow Wilson Bridge crosses into Maryland, that sort of 210 exchange on the Beltway. And it has so much rich archaeological uh, material that was disturbed by those various highway projects. The site doesn't exist anymore. But we have roughly 700 boxes of artifacts from this site, which is about 10% of our entire holdings at the map lab. And there are two structures here. One is was built by John Addison, sort of 1680s to 1730s. Um, and all these artifacts came from that particular site. Now, John Addison moved out there uh, in the late 17th century when people really <coughs> weren't living that far inland uh, in terms of like the Europeans. They, they were mostly down still in southern Maryland, so they, he was sort of on the border with the Native American territories. And he was a merchant who traded with Indians. Um, and as part of his function, um, as one of those sort of frontier merchant planters, he had to keep a weapons magazine. He was the colonel of militia for that area. So if there was ever a threat from those Native Americans, it was sort of his job to gather up whoever was in his area and be that front line to defend um, the European Maryland colony against those attacks. And happily for us archaeologists, this house burned down with all of those weapons in it. And so there was a cellar, which you, this image up here that you're seeing is a cellar with post holes that are the structure that were up over the cellar. So that cellar had in it a whole bunch of guns, a whole bunch of swords, um, horse-related stuff. They clearly were ready to outfit some horses for, for the people to have to go out and defend the territory. Um, and we roughly know that this house burned down around 1730, so we also have an end date for all of those weapons. So this is a really great site, archaeologically speaking, and it allows us to interpret all of the weaponry that we might see in that land Earth. Now at the same site, so John Addison died in 1711, um, and his son took over, decided to build a different house, same property, you know, another little bit, bit of a bigger house. Um, and his house is really remarkable because we have a well that survives from his house. And this well was filled in sometime between 1720 and 1750. And what's amazing for us in terms of that particular site 
is that all of those artifacts in that well are in our outlander time period, which is about the 1740s. So we can use those artifacts. And the well below a certain level was below the water table. And when you have stagnant water in a well, um, there's no oxygen getting into that water. It's just sitting still. That means that those little microbes and bacteria, they can't survive in that well either. And again, we get organic preservation. Uh, so we were able to put in this exhibit real leather for staff, real tobacco leaves from the 1720 to 1750 time period, real seeds that survived, squash seeds. These are probably a sweet pea. Um, corks, real corks from all the wine that they were drinking. So all of those organics that are in this exhibit are the real deal. Um, and so that was so much fun to go shopping in those boxes for those particular artifacts. All right. So we got all of this put together in our visitor center exhibit um, in time for the, the Celtic Festival at our park. Um, the Celtic Festival is uh, an event that Jefferson Patterson Park and Museum hosts each year, but it's really, uh, we're just the venue, the Southern Maryland Celtic Festival or Celtic Society actually puts it on. Uh, but we decided to go ahead and scramble and get it done like uh, two days before our deadline for the library so that we could have it up at the Celtic Festival. And that was really great because we had about 200 people come that day and it generated some buzz. So we got some people to go up to the library. So this is what it looked like there. Uh, and we were just repurposing some old cases, which is how we ended up with the exhibit like we have downstairs. And so what I'm going to do sort of for the rest of this talk is get into the accuracies, inaccuracies, things that we like about the show and, and how it's portraying this time period based on what you've seen now. We've got our archaeological background, you've seen how we got the exhibit together. Um, and the rest is really going to be about what we thought was like really good and maybe not so good about the show um, portrayed in terms of this time period. So I'm starting with success stories. And I really feel like all of this tableware that they show on the television series is really very good. I've actually had people ask me, oh, well, they wouldn't have really used all of those stemware with all the bulbs and stuff like in Scotland, really? And I'm like, no, really, they did. They even had that here. Um, and we have the actual stemware to prove it. And I brought a couple of examples that didn't make it into the exhibit, so you can see those up close today, too. Uh, but for the most part, whenever you see people drinking in the show, which is a lot, they do a lot of drinking in the show, and in the books, so it's all very, and, and really in the 18th century, there was a lot of drinking. So all of that is very historically accurate. Um, but these glasses that seem like they're so dainty and aren't necessarily what you would picture in colonial Maryland are also very historically accurate. And most of the stemware we have comes from that Addison Oxen Hill site, which was very sort of on the edge of the frontier. Yes, it was a well-off family, um, but you know they, they don't have brick architecture. They're not, they're not um, I don't know. It's not like you're going to a royal court or anything, you know? Like they, they had uh, structures like you see out here on this site, like the carpenter's shop, you know, those are the kinds of structures they had. And, and they are using mm -hmm. these kinds of, of drinking vessels. I also feel like this show does a really great job with the firearms. Um, we have a lot of pieces of firearms. Firearms are not my specialty necessarily, but from what I can tell looking at the show, they definitely match everything that we have in our collections. I have a theory on this though, which is that there are so many people out there who are so into <coughs> their firearms that like, I don't think any television show would really be able to get away with having muskets and pistols in the television show without getting a lot of complaints about it if they were wrong. Um, so I think they are all generally well done. I mean, they're probably getting them from getting help and extras and things from, from reenacting communities who really care about the accuracy. So they're, they're really well done. Um, another panel that we really, we sort of took a lot of liberties with this one, and that's the Sassanac Soldiers panel. Uh, we took one scene from the show where uh, Jack Randall is getting a shave, 
and really played off of everything we could see in that scene. So you see the picture of basin, candlestick. Uh, we think there's like a snuff box sitting on the table back there, but it's a little blurry. It could be something else for all we know. Um, he's got a window held in place with window leads. So we just sort of took this one and ran with it um, and wanted to talk about not only things that would just be laying around that soldiers might use to pass the time and, and to, to have their daily life, uh, but also all of these soldiers who are super dressed up, um, you know, we find that to be very fun to interpret because we have things over here like wig curlers and we have um, button molds and um, from the Oxen Hill Well, there was uh, essentially a button cover that was made of a golden color, so like a copper alley, like a brass. Um, thread covered button like you see the soldiers wearing here. So all of that braid is that metallic thread embroidery. We do have that. We know it was in Maryland. It wasn't just something that these soldiers wore. So we wanted to play out those dressy soldiers a little bit. Uh, horses are one of my most favorite specialties of things to study. Uh, all this horse related stuff I don't actually ride, but I really like metal artifacts. So this is, this is one of the things that I get really into. And I've been really excited watching the show. You could ask my husband, he'd be like, I'd be like, that saddle is so great. He'd be like, okay. Um, but Jamie's saddle and bridle and all of the ornamentation on it is all very good. I get excited about when his stirrups are right. You know, like we have those things in our collection and I can look at that and say, yeah, they got that just so. Um, and I have all of the images to prove it. So, um, so we decided to use Jamie on horseback in the exhibit so that we could show that those kinds of saddles and bridles were here in Maryland too. But here's where I'm going to get a little critical. Okay, so uh, Claire's horse is not just, just not as good. So uh, not in terms of historical accuracy. Beautiful bridle. I love all this leather cut work on it. Um, but I feel like that's a little more Lord of the Rings than, um, you know, 18th century Scotland or Maryland. Um, and what I think is going on here, we're going to start getting into this a little bit more and more, is that there's a lot of things that have to happen to put a TV show together. You're not going to be able to get, at, at in, you know, an instant phone call, 30 saddles and bridles that look accurate for the 1740s. Um, so you're calling around, I think, to different prop stores and places where you can do all these prop rentals and I think that people are trading around from different productions. Um, and so that's why I, I look at this and I think Lord of the Rings has got this sort of elfin thing to it. Um, and uh, I'm I was particularly sort of, I was looking at her stirrups, which you can see her stirrup down here. Um, and then the stirrups over in this corner are in fact a surviving 18th century stirrup. So they are historically accurate in terms of the date. Um, but these are from Turkey, and like we don't get them in Maryland. I doubt they have that many in Scotland, and if they did, I doubt they would be having their stranger, we don't know where you came from, chick riding around on the horse with like the special imported Turkish stirrup. So, so I take a little issue with her, unfortunately. Uh, we had a lot of fun with uh, Claire's surgery. So Claire's a nurse. She goes back in time. She's appalled by the health care back then. You know, 1945 versus 1743, the health care is very different. Um, and, and so she sort of takes on this role of being a healer because she just can't stand it. So she sort of bullies her way into situations so that she can be like, don't do that to that cut. I'm going to take care of it kind of thing. And so she ends up as a healer. And they're, they're always seeing her with little bottles and containers and harvesting herbs and doing all of these things that you do when you're mixing concoctions and, and living off of uh, garden uh, medicinals as opposed to what she would have had access to in the 1940s. And I love these scenes. I have one big historical inaccuracy issue with this scene. I think it's beautiful. Um, I think most of the material culture is really good, but I have one big thing. Anyone want to guess? Anyone see this and are like, wait, I think I know what's going on there. I saw you with your hand up, Sam. Well, I don't like the candles. The candles, exactly. Um, if, if you lived in, in 1740s, this would be the equivalent of like leaving all your lights on all the time, whether you were in the room or not, right? So, I mean, candle making in this time period um, is its own industry. If you're doing it at home, it's extremely 
really tedious. Have you ever been to the living history sites where you can do that, where you can dip candles, and it's like dip, 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 like over, like, you wouldn't just burn them all at the same time. Um, so that's one of those things that I think, oh wow, it's really beautiful, but it's just so wrong. <laughs> um, but definitely made for TV. Uh, and now we're going to get into the costume a little bit. Um, and I'm going to start with the men. And I also want to start with a very big disclaimer here. So uh, if any of you are into costume, any big clothing people? <coughs> so, okay, a couple. Well, I don't know, I know a couple. Um, if you're really into historic 18th century costume, I think this is going to be the most frustrating thing about the show. Um, and the big disclaimer I want to put out there is that Terry Dressbach, who is the costumer for this show, knows 18th century costume. She's done her research, she looks at images, she knows, like she does get it. So when there are inaccuracies, more often than not, there's some television reason for it. Um, largely being that you can't just come up with a bunch of 18th century clothing on a whim. You're having to sew all of that yourself and you're probably taking shortcuts. Um, but also, she has to tell a story. So these costumes aren't just there to be 100% historically accurate, they're there to help build the characters and to help the viewer understand how those characters relate to each other. And I want you all to know that I get that. Like, I watch this show and I might cringe at a particular costume thing, but at the same time, I get why she's doing it, and I get that like I'm probably not the person that she's like making those costumes for necessarily. Um, so with that disclaimer out there, um, let's talk about the men's costume because again, I love to start with the success stories, and I think the men's costume is really pretty good. Uh, so what you're seeing here is one of the panels from the exhibit that we decided to feature. Uh, in large part because, I mean, look at that picture, but also, <laughs> um, the, the costume is really very good. Um, I know almost nothing about the history of kilts, except that the whole idea that we have of, of clan plaid and those kinds of things are largely Victorian era um, inventions, and so don't necessarily date all the way back to this time period. But just because I was working on this exhibit and working on this talk, I did go back and look at all kinds of 18th century depictions of Scottish men in kilts, especially soldiers. And as far as I can tell, the kilts in the show are really well done. Um, the coat, so he's wearing a typical man's outfit, um, a coat, a waistcoat, which eventually morphed into today's vest. A shirt underneath, that's his main undergarment, a stock around the neck. All of that is very typical of men's dress pretty much throughout the English and European world at this time. The kilt is really the only thing that um, is, is different than <coughs> Scottish. Um, so yeah, so I find this costume to be pretty well done. I have a few nitpicky things about the buttons, but I won't bore you with those, uh, those details unless you want to ask me about it later, I will tell you. Um, but, I, you know, his shirt on his wedding night is really well done, and this is what men wore as their undergarment. So a lot of people find this very surprising, um, but if your undergarment was a shirt um, and you're wearing a kilt, <laughs> then there's really kind of just like air down there. Um, <laughs> men in this time period, when they wore breeches, those shirts were really long, and so you just kind of tuck the shirt up around everything. And that is just your one undergarment that you end up laundering on a regular basis, which your outerwear you don't launder so often. I think one issue I have with Jamie Fraser, and I don't really have much of an issue with it, is that he always wears boots. And in this time period, you generally only wear your boots if you're riding. Um, boots at this time period were sort of this tough leather, probably not usually as slouchy as what you see him wearing. Um, they were usually called jack boots, and that's because of there was a jack leather, like a jack leather mug that was very popular, and it's just very stiff, and so the jack boots got their name from that. Anyway, they weren't comfortable to walk in. You're sort of clomping around. Um, so for the most part, unless you were riding, and granted, Jamie does a lot of riding in the show, but for the most part, men would wear shoes. But I think you'll agree with me that this look is not 
quite that heartthrob masculine look that probably the show was going for, right? So I forgive them for leaving him in boots at all times, even on his wedding day. Um, here are some more examples of these statsmen and what the kilts would have looked like. All of these are period 18th century men. Um, and you can just, you just know that a modern day audience isn't going to look at those socks and be like, that guy. <laughs> That's attractive. So I, I totally forgive them for that. Uh, so let's move on to the women. So I'm going to come back to Claire's dress. This is just sort of introducing her on our last panel, which is the Claire panel. Um, and we're going to get into her clothes a little bit. But before I get into her clothes, I've got to sort of um, get off my chest that one, like the women's costume is really where the most actual inaccuracies are. Um, and I understand the reasons, and I'll, I'll, I think I understand most of the reasons, and I'll share those as we go along. Um, so this is Claire's outfit. We're going to come back to this in a minute. Um, but first, let's talk about Gita Duncan. So I know a lot of you aren't familiar with the Outlander series, but Gila Duncan is this one character in the show who is married to a very wealthy guy in town. She befriends Claire, and for whatever reason, she always looks like she's wearing like a dead animal. <laughs> um, and I, you know, so she's been picked on by this blog that I really love. So if you're into costume, there's a blog called Frock Flicks that basically takes, and Karen's into it, like, um, that takes any period costume, television drama, television movie, whatever, and has costume historians who go through and evaluate. Um, and they have an annual snark week, um, which is where we got this particular um, image from, and I really enjoy snark week, um, because they, they sort of take some of these costume decisions to task. Um, I know, for example, that Terry Dressbach, the costumer for the show, looked at this hood over here. She was going with an 18th century pattern. She had like an existing garment from a museum that she was looking at, but then sort of put all this like felted wool on it for Gilas's character. Um, and it's sort of hard to tell this dress in the middle, but it has like a frayed fabric um, instead of a lace cuff. Um, it's just a frayed fabric a little bit. That's not accurate. This, her, the fichu, which is the thing around the neck, is like felted wool, which that's not really what fichus were made out of in this time period. And the belt buckle, it, like if you looked up 1900 belt buckle on eBay, you would find a ton of those. So this is not an 18th century thing. Um, but the reasons, there are a lot of reasons for Gilas' character being dressed differently. And it largely has to do with plot points in the show. She's, she's a witch and she's a murderer. So she is sort of this character who's kind of outside the norm. And so even though she's fairly wealthy, she's kind of always dressed in these things that, that you look at. And you're supposed to look at it, I think, and be like, there's something off there. Because her character has something off there. So coming back to Claire's wedding dress. So initially, I had a lot of issues with Claire's wedding dress. Normally, in this time period, a gown would open at the front, not the back, the sleeves up the back. Uh, it wouldn't have that whole shredded sleeve thing, but I did a little research, uh, like looking at all those frog flick blogs and everything online, and discovered that in fact this is based on a real garment. Um, and part of the reason that I have this issue with it not being too terribly typical is that it's based on a garment that only would have been worn in a royal European court. Um, and so that is where I'm like, what? Um, so Claire's wedding dress is, is beautiful. I love, for example, it has metallic thread embroidery. So Terry Dressback like put, took that technique that we find evidence of here, and that's like really on the dress. That's fantastic. Um, but I do think it's a little bit it's a little bit off that she's got this royal level wedding dress. Um, in the show, there's kind of this weird backstory as to how she gets the gown, um, and it, some guy lost it gambling and or not necessarily gambling, but he was in a body house and he needed to pay. And so he paid with his gown that he had had. He was supposed to deliver to somebody anyway. So it's not a total like inaccuracy, but it is it is a little sort of over the top, but um, that's largely my personal preference. And these are all examples of gowns that I like to show, just to give you an idea of these are surviving gowns from this time period that would have been silk, that would have been high-end, 
that, that I sort of had envisioned based on the books what Claire's wedding dress would have looked like. Granted, I don't know how these would have shown on TV. You know, if you have sort of like a yellowish silk dress, is it going to shine for the camera? I don't know. Um, and it also is a little bit jarring in terms of not necessarily fitting in with the look of Scotland that she has going on. Um, but suffice it to say, these are what most of the gowns of this time period look like, opening in the front with a petticoat underneath. Uh, a lot of her accessories, we just sort of abandoned the show, uh, the whole interpretation on the show of her accessories and used what we actually find archaeologically. Because in the show um, and in the books, she's given a wedding ring, she's given a string of pearls that passed down in Jamie's family. Um, and for those of you who watched the show, you will appreciate how hard it was to find a picture of those pearls that was like for public consumption, because that was a crazy <laughs> scene. Um, but, so in the show, she's given a super long string of pearls, and that was really jarring, because that time period, it was a much smaller string of pearls, and in the books, too. Uh, and she's also given this ring that Jamie has very sentimentally in the show, made out of his, a key to his ancestral home. So they take it down to the blacksmith, and they have him take the piece of the key and turn it into this ring. Um, in the books, it's a silver ring, and I found this to be a really sort of jarring and, and unpleasant trip into sentimentality because, as I'm sure you are all aware, in the 18th century, just like today, the properties of metals are as follows. Wrought iron rusts. <laughs> like, you don't want to wear a wrought iron ring, right? Like, your hand is going to turn brown. Um, and so while it was, you know, lovely story, like I wish they'd sort of kept with the silver ring, but also had a lovely story with it in the books. So for our panel, we just used whatever we had in our collection. So there was a brass ring, which would have eventually turned her finger green, but still is a little bit more in the realm of, of reality, and a silver ring. Um, and then we used various other <coughs> accessories that we found. I will give major kudos, though, to the staff for getting the underwear right. Um, and this is where I always tell this story, and Sam, you're actually here today, so you get to hear this story. So my friend Samantha, who's here today, uh, recently got married, and we had all these craft, craft days where we were making flowers to go to her wedding, and we watched Outlander um, at one of these, and the wedding scene in particular. And for those of us who are in historic costume, there was this moment where, um, you know, it's, it's the wedding night, and so Jamie, you know, finally is getting up the nerve. He's, he's an innocent, right? So he's getting up the nerve to approach the wife, and he hikes up her shift, and somebody in our crowd screams, yes! And, it, and I was like, I know, the stockings and garters are totally accurate, right? <laughs> and that really was why we were cheering. Um, you know, I mean, we all know what's going to happen on the wedding night, but we didn't know that they were going to get those stockings and garters just right. Because in this time period, uh, a woman's undergarment was her shift, and then you wore stockings, you tied those up with garters, this is days before elastic. Um, and then, depending on the kind of um, gown you're wearing, you might have these, the, the hip things are called paniers, and, um, and she did have those on for her gown on her wedding night. That was very, you know, like fun. They actually included that detail. And then stays would have been that time period's version of a corset, which gives the gown and the body support and shape. Um, the stays, I am told by, again, my friend Sam, who did her whole master's thesis on stays, uh, I sort of took issue with yet the fact that they unlaced in the front, but I'm told that that actually is okay. Like, they usually unlace in the back, but sometimes they unlace in the front. Um, but the biggest problem with the stays in the show probably is that she's just really crushed up top, and that's not historically accurate. Um, and in a way, I almost buy that in the show, because it's not her dress, and it's obtained in this, like, body house. And so, you know, you wouldn't necessarily expect it to fit her just so, so maybe that's all right. But here are some examples of actual 18th century stays that you can use to compare to what she's wearing. All right, so on to some more inaccuracies. So there are all these chunky knits in this show that, that just drive me insane. Um, because they have become extremely popular. There's now like all these Pinterest links to patterns to these chunky knits. It's like, wear Claire's cowl thing, you know? Um, and people are really into it, um, but it's so not historically accurate. And um, I really take, take issue with the, she's 
always wearing these like knit leg warmers on her wrists, and I'm just like, whoa. Um, and from what I understand is that part of the reason for this and a lot of her accessories is that she's one of the only characters who changes clothes throughout the show, and that is to show that time has passed. So if everybody wears the same outfit every day, like they probably did very often in the 18th century, then it's hard to show on television, this is the next day. And so she has all these different accessories for that. And I think, although you know, I'm not in a costumer's head, but I think that these chunky knits sort of fit into their feel of Scotland at this time. Um, but my feeling is that if you lived in Scotland at this time and you were, you know, there were breezes and it was cold and it was raining, you would want your knits to not be full of holes that let all of the cold air pass through. Um, so let me show you what was accurate for this time period. Um, so here are some examples of some 18th century knits, and you can see them in a detail over here in this photo. So they do look like they're sort of just kind of hanging out on the wrists and they are a little bit loose, but they're usually made uh, not of that sort of big chunky knit, but of linen or sometimes silk. Uh, they might be made of wool. And they can be knit. So here are examples of three 18th century knit mitts, which is hard to say. Um, but they're knit in a much more fine uh, uh, pattern, I guess. The stitches are much closer together. And so I brought some stockings that I have from my collection, one pair that dates to 1819, and some others that are sort of the same technology, that you can see just how tightly knit a lot of these knits really were. Uh, just an example of this is showing you up close to how small the needles are, how tight that weave is. And then also, like you can see in the detail that the needles are very bendy. That's because they're just so, they're so small. Uh, so she also often is wearing, so she's got her cowl and she got this weird woven thing. Uh, sometimes they get it right. Sometimes they get her fichu or her collar um, sort of thing. Um, there are some 18th century examples you can see compared to ones that she wears on the show that I was like, yeah, I think I got right that day. Um, but oftentimes it's not necessarily totally accurate. And, and again, from my collection at home, I don't have anything from this time period, but I have stuff from the early 19th century before technology changed enough that the fabrics were really different. So I brought two different um, collar sorts of things of the really lightweight sort of muslin-like fabrics that they would have used. <laughs> And then this is just a shot to show you all of her different outfits, the way that if you're watching this show and you're thinking about the 18th century and you think that when somebody goes off, um, you know, she's called out to travel with the group while they go around and collect rent, you know, she goes off for a walk, it seems like she has an outfit change for all of these occasions. And when she's out on a horse, you know, living rough, she has like her fur coat, her, you know, chunky knit cowl, you know, three different gowns to change into. And that part just isn't really accurate. And I think that that is that way that they're telling time. It also is very odd, I should add, at this time period, that this person who appeared out of nowhere from 1945 suddenly has this fully um, custom-made wardrobe, which, you know, clothing in this time period is very expensive and usually made to fit your body. So. So it's just not plausible that she would have had this level of wardrobe so soon. That would have represented a really big investment. Um, and then another thing in the show, in terms of costumes, and then winding down now, uh, that I find, this is very much a television thing, but I think it's interesting to think about for the 18th century, is that the classes, how they're depicted, you know, lower class versus upper class um, versus middle class, they're all, the, the way that they're dressed is sort of overemphasizing their changes in costumes in way, uh, ways that uh, modern audiences can understand but wouldn't necessarily be all that accurate. So you see her standing next to this village woman up here in the corner, and this, this woman, like her outfit is a little raggy, and um, the way it's laced up the front is a little more medieval looking to me, and also it doesn't seem like she has any stays on. You know, she just doesn't have that put together look of the 18th century. And, um, and I think that they're trying to show a class distinction, but really that isn't necessarily how in the 18th century they would have had those class distinctions. So I show you um, this man up in the corner, he's, he's a beggar. He's one of the characters in the show, and he's a beggar. 
But they put him in this ragged coat, which I have to think, if you're living in the heather, is going to catch on everything, you know? And that if he was really, you know, having a coat that was that broken down, he would cut off all those threads and put a patch on it, you know? Um, but I know that the costumer really loves that costume. She's really into it. And I'm thinking, it's just not practical. Um, but so all of these images on the bottom, I, I'm showing you because they're all women who are working. You know, they're the maids that are polishing and cleaning the floors and doing the laundry. And they all are wearing gowns and petticoats that are protected by aprons. You know, their hair is protected by caps. But, but they are still wearing your standard gown and petticoat attire, and it's pretty clear that they all have stays on. They all have that shaping of the body. You know, you don't just not wear underwear if you're in the lower class. Um, so in this time period, the ways that you can tell about how someone dresses, what class they are, are very different. Um, and I think would have been a little too subtle to put in the show that maybe the public wouldn't just let you get it right away. Um, but there really was a way of doing that signaling. It just isn't necessarily what we would be used to. And this is just one final um, image to emphasize that point. So up in the corner is a is the 18th century depiction of a cotter's house. So the cotters in Scotland in the books are sort of the lowest sort of level farmers um, in Scotland that are referred to. And you can see that even in the cotter's house, they're not in rags. They're put together. Um, and maybe, so oftentimes class um, might be distinguished by like the, the quality of the fabric or how old is that dress or is it second hand, but not necessarily the overall look. Um, so that's depicting that. And then in this bottom picture, I just love this picture because these are all women who are painting fabric for a living. And so they're working for a living. They're working women, they're going in, they're getting a paycheck, they're helping support themselves, and none of them look like they're ragged to me. You know, they all look like they have their own kind of style. There's different styles of hats and caps and, and collars and jackets, but they all are still fairly well put together, um, even though they're working women. So that's pretty much what I've got, is um, I've gone through all of my costume issues. I've, Praise all kinds of parts of the show that I think I think a lot of the show really is so well done. And part of the reason that the costumes sometimes get to me is is because I'm into that, but also because everything else is so good. Um, and so if you guys want to come up and get a closer look at any of the artifacts that didn't make it in the exhibit, um, that's what I brought them for, so you can get a closer look. You know, feel how lightweight those corks are from that well. Um, get a closer look at some of the clothes, and I've also brought a bunch of books on the clothing just in case anybody who here is into that. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm willing to entertain those too. Any questions first? Yeah, go ahead. Um, how do you preserve the leather that you acquired? Do you have to do anything special with it? Yeah. Uh, so the conservation department at the lab, so what I do as a curator is I walk it down to conservation right. and I give them a work order and an artifact and I say, see this, <laughs> and, and they will take care of it. Uh, for the most part, that leather from the tannery and, and from the well, um, it's already been preserved um, in the burial environment and certainly from the tannery, um, the chemicals that are used are used to preserve leather just like we use today. And so that leather is actually in pretty good shape. But the conservators are going to go in and sort of stabilize it a little bit more. And actually, you can see on the pairs of shoes up here, they sort of took some of the pieces and put like a webbing underneath it to support it a little bit better. And then they might also put a, a consolidation kind of thing. Like um, they, well, I know better what they do for metals. I don't know what chemicals they would have used for leather. But something to sort of help the material in the leather not, not turn to powder. But to sort of stay as one object. And oftentimes what's used like for glass and for metal objects is uh, something called B72, which is a lot like clear nail polish. If you picture clear nail polish, if you picture sort of um, putting an artifact in that and pulling a vacuum on it so that, and then drying it off, then you've got that sort of consolidated in one spot. I don't know if they would have used that on leather, but that same kind of concept, I think. What about the leaf of tobacco? The leaf of tobacco is just fine on its own. And I brought another one, uh, a smaller one, uh, so that you guys, again, 
can get a closer look. Uh, and now it's in pretty good shape. Again, the conservators might have done something to it uh, somewhere along the way. I don't really know. Um, but you know, you can actually get it out, and it, it, it smells more like tobacco than it does like a chemical. So yeah, it's it's the real deal. Um, so yeah, we you know we're in Maryland, so we're tobacco colony. So even though they don't show a lot of pipe smoking on the Outlander show, we had to throw that in there. We put it in the soldier section just because. Um, but yeah, we we had to 